we'll, we'll have a kind of slightly different uh, uh, discussion here. Um, my mind tends to wander, and so a lot of times when I'm even doing my slides, you, you get to kind of wander with me. So here we go. And I just turned it off. What did I do? Oh, okay. Oh, no. All right. Okay, good, good. So, so just first thing, just as a correction, I'm no longer in uh, Albuquerque. I'm in Lodi, California now. I did a two-year stint at uh, uh, Albuquerque uh, at the New Mexico Cancer Center. And, uh, but just kind of a bit about me, I, don't, I look back. Some of you guys probably know who this guy is, right? You probably know the movie. This is, you know, and so this is my eighth grade graduation, man. I died. I had to have this suit, man. My mom finally kind of broke it out. But probably some of you guys, I, I'm looking at some faces who you may know this from, from historical like you. I, were you alive even during, the, during this time? Young lady. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you weren't alive. Yeah, I a, had one of those suits. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. She wouldn't let me flare my collar, though. She said, no, you're going to wear a tie. And so... Anyway, but um, so a lot of understanding this is a fellow course. Do does, is everyone out here doing outside of the like Doug and, and the initial presenter? Any is everyone out here done vertebral augmentation? Are they familiar with it? So, so this is pretty much what, what happens in my practice. Um, I, I'm starting to get known in my area for, for doing these cases, so I'll just get some type of study. Sometimes it's just an x-ray. They'll come to me and I have to work them up, but it can be anything like the first uh, uh, image here, where there's really significant compression of vertebral plana, so that alters my approach. Uh, this is another patient, a patient who is pretty much home homebound. Uh, uh, so how I approach this patient is going to be slightly different. Uh, up to the patients that are coming from my oncologist, where you can see uh, polyostotic metastasis. And so I have to come up with some approach. So it keeps my job very interesting because with, uh, with the plethora of patients coming in like this, you, you don't know what you're going to get. But one of the first things I like to kind of enforce is, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with imaging, but when this imaging comes in, and this is a trick I learned from working with oncologists, this becomes a great initial step for your planning. How are you going to approach? Uh, specifically like L5, um, it frequently forces a different angulation with your C-arm. And you should be able to start to mentally anticipate. So you can see like for a case like this, there was a lot of C-arm manipulation. And we're going to talk about this case a little bit uh, further. But when you first start seeing these images, uh, you should start imagining, you know, how, how is my C-arm going to have to come in so that I'm in plane uh, with the end plates? Because that's one of the key things you want to do when you're setting up. You really need to be in plane uh, with the superior or whatever the end, the end plates are. Also, what, one thing you should start thinking about as you look at this imaging, the majority of my compression fracture, say in this vertebral body, is superior end plate. The majority of my compression fracture and this vertebral body is inferior in plate. So if you begin to think like that, uh, you will begin to apply uh, your submit specifically more effectively to the area that, that actually participates in the fracture. Kind of my thinking is I need to span normal bone, but I really need to anticipate a trajectory that brings me in line with the main portion of the fracture. So planning becomes a significant thing that you can get off a lot of your imaging. But when you start to see cases like this, you know, uh, you should be thinking about uh, how you're going to approach the patient. But how about when you get cases like this? So this comes from my oncologist, patient with obvious brain mets. And so when I begin to see images like this, um, of course, I'm not thinking that this is a standard fracture anymore. This is the fracture uh, that's probably going to be related to metastasis. So what are the other things I can bring to this patient uh, as, as one who not only performs vertebral augmentation, but one who takes care of uh, significant pain in, in this patient population. So when you see these previous images, who do you become? Are you that guy? You know, it's like, oh my, you know, what's going on? Well, I'm no longer that guy. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the right on guy, because you know, a, a case coming into my practice like this, um, being not just someone who 
takes care of patients, but someone who runs an office now, these become uh, pretty significant cases for you. Um, because when you get a patient like this who's had significant fracture, who has metastasis, it's typically not just that, uh, that presenting fracture that you're taking care of. You end up taking care of a lot of other uh, issues in that patient. So that's why I say I kind of wander a lot. A lot, a lot of times, I mean, how many of you guys as fellows you don't get a lot of vacation time. I remember, you know, when I was going through training, you know, like. Hey, Chris gets lots of vacation time. He does. He's been off this whole week. Wow, see. I mean, he was off part of last week or the week before. But, you know, he's got, he's the most important time. Right now, just, just some interesting history. Doug actually trained me. Um, we were both in the Air Force together. And so back then, you know, once a year, you may get 14 days. Uh, and so I frequently go on my, I, I put a slide in like this. This was outside Anchorage. Uh, it, it was a glacier. And so I just get to kind of go there for a second. Okay. All right. <laughs> so now a couple of things that, that, that I think it's great to hear how these cases are done. But I think a, another positive th that I can bring is I've done a lot of great cases. But if you do a lot of cases, you're going to have these, which means if you're going through your practice and you're only having great practice, only great outcomes, either you're not doing enough cases or you're lying to yourself. Uh, when I was in the radiology, in my basic radiology uh, training, one of my staff would come in and he'd say, okay, we have a stack of film to read through. And he goes, so do you want to miss them fast or do you want to miss them slow? Because as you're reading through x-rays, you are missing things. Um, so um, I'm going to share with you a lot of my uh, untoward uh, outcomes and the things I learned from them. Now, I don't know, Doug, I've never heard smooth margin sign in, in relationship to, to, uh, to uh, uh, vertebral augmentation. No, that's an easy arrangement. But one of the things I notice is um, a lot of times when I'm in, I'm, I'm in the lateral now. I plan my trajectory from my imaging. I'm starting to fill, and this is a, a separate case, but you notice the margins here are nice and fluffy. Fluffy, fluffy kind of almost cloud-like margins. When you start to see really smooth margins like this, you should begin to question that something's not quite right because the inner portion of, of the vertebral body is it's trabeculated. And so what ends up happening is you get these kind of fluffy margins. When I start to see this, I've learned now to stop and check my AP view. And what happened was, is this what, is this. I was outside the vertebral body. Now, when I start to do these cases, now I'm up in the thoracic spine, another uh, learning point here is, kind of like Doug said, specifically in uh, my grandmas, my, my, my uh, thinner women, um, those thoracic uh, vertebral bodies are more narrow. Um, the things that you do to them, you have to be more careful. Um, depending on the company that I'm using, uh, there are separate devices that I use to traverse the midline. And in this case, I knew that I had just literally tapped the lateral margin when I was going across midline. So when I swung to my lateral and began to fill, I began to see these smooth margins. And what it was is, is I was uh, outside the vertebral body. So when you start to see smooth margins in your filling, suspect that your cement is either filling something. Now, it can be filling a void, uh, as in uh, someone who may have metastasis and, and have a big lytic lesion. Um, sometimes when you do bloom kyphoplasty, you may begin to fill uh, that cavity that you created, but eventually those margins should become more trabeculated. And so <clears throat> it's one of the things I look for now. And I remember that if I'm passing across midline, I don't have the ability to pass as significantly in, uh, in women as I do in men because those thoracic vertebral bodies are much more narrow. This is the device I was talking about specifically. I love the device that allows me to do some great things, but like in any uh, technology, you have to be aware of the strengths of that technology, the limitations of that technology, and apply them appropriately. So what's too compressed? Uh, as you can see in this vertebral body, uh, the vertebral body was actually flatter than my jam sheeting needle. So no matter how uh, I was able to get into that vertebral body. 
I was basically going to be disrupting superior and inferior end plates. So I stabilized this patient and I managed her. Managed her. Uh, this patient was a different patient, okay? Now, this is kind of interesting. I didn't know uh, that Dr. Beal was going to be on, uh, was, was actually going to be lecturing as well. So I had, he had sent this to me, so I stole uh, his images uh, to kind of talk about that previous case. Um, but uh, has anybody here done discography? Because this, to me, is very similar to discography. When I get ready to do this case, I set the patient up like I'm going to do a discogram. And this is typically the view I get. I typically will drop them below the nose of the Scotty dog into the uh, disc, and that's my typical approach. So that's what I do. I set up like I'm going to use the inferior uh, end plate approach uh, for the patients I like this. And it's like anything you do, you know, kind of one of my hobbies is, is I build furniture. And after a while, you know, I have that go-to plane, I have that go-to saw. Um, you fill your toolbox with... Uh, with things you learn from other people's experience and then you apply accordingly. But the, uh, the inferior end plate approach, it's, it's so expanded my capability to take care of different uh, patient population. And again, it's great in vertebra plana, but if I look at a patient, and I, I'll have a case a little bit later, if I look at that patient and the majority of their fracture is involving the inferior end plate, I will typically use the inferior end plate approach as, as well to focus my my, my cement there. So this patient ended up being treated. And the other thing I'd like to tell you, this was not the greatest appearance uh, in terms of vertebral augmentation, but frequently uh, you have to get away from treating the appearance of your image, okay? Uh, uh, sometimes a, a, a beautiful appearing image is not the best clinical outcome. And so obviously in treating these patients, you really wanna be following uh, uh, outcome. And this patient did extremely well uh, following this, okay? Pretty, okay. So what happens when you get a patient like this? Uh, this patient, um, actually ended up having two levels treated by me. One I was really proud of, and one, well, I'll kind of show you. So this patient came to me actually from a friend of mine who's a, who's a spine surgeon and had a significant component of retropulsion, uh, but he wanted this vertebral body stabilized, and it actually ended up being this vertebral body. He wanted this vertebral body stabilized before he ended up doing a, a three-level uh, uh, fixation on this patient. Looks great from the lateral, right? And you got the nice fluffy margin. You see a little trail off here, but I was feeling pretty good about that until, is that not a very unattractive outcome? But this is a, a, a very prominent 90-plus-year-old uh, gentleman in our community. He had such significant pain relief that he fought uh, going to uh, stabilization. and uh, But he had already seen he had the component of retropulsion. So he ended up getting a three-level treatment, okay? About two months later, he came back with significant pain and, you know, greater pain than he had had after his procedure. We got an MRI, long story short, had actually fractured this vertebral body as well. And again, you see what I ended up doing. I, you can see basically these are pedicle screws, so it's really marking the levels of our pedicles. I ended up using, the, uh, again, the inferior end plate approach and I was able to, to get good fixation, good stabilization, and this guy did well. Um, you can see I was able to actually traverse and was able to treat pedicle to pedicle on this guy. But that was the inferior end plate approach. So again, a powerful tool I've learned. Um, uh, how many levels are too many? Um, I, I had traditionally been taught one or two levels. Um, you have to worry about issues of payment, but I got this patient who you remember from the opening, and her story was this is a person who found it very difficult to travel. So the family members were really pleading with me to try to take care of her in a single setting, okay? I truly, I had never done four levels before, um, but this, this patient came in, and I told him, I said, you know, it really depends on how the case flows. Turns out the case flowed very well, and uh, I was able to treat her. Um, so remember what I said. I said, if when getting images like this, one of the things you should begin to think about is, 
what component of the vertebral bodies are affected. And so when I begin to plan my approach to the uh, vertebral body, I really want to be concentrating the majority of my delivered cement to the area of fracture if possible. Um, so I can plan that out. And I was able to plan what type of approach I wanted on each one of those vertebral bodies. And that's what I did. You can kind of see here, with the majority of the fracture being superior in plate, that's really where I concentrated. And it's why two views are so important. The, the rule uh, Dr. Beal really talked about, you don't want to traverse the medial wall of that pedicle, something really significant. But your, your planned trajectory is only going to come from that lateral image. So manipulating both of those images to yours and the patient's advantage are, is really kind of paramount. This was really the majority, was the center of the vertebral body. This was largely lower portion of the vertebral body. So I plan, plan my trajectory toward uh, the inferior and then so forth. And so that was my approach. This was Phil. And you can see, again, with that planning, the majority of that superior fracture was superior end plate. So when we go to the fracture itself, the majority of that, based on that delivery, really treated superior end plate, middle. Um, so planning becomes really significant. And I think a lot of times MR and CT are underutilized by people who are doing these procedures. They go in, they go, I, I'm going to approach this case. But you, you can uh, really draw a, a lot of focus uh, from, the previous, from the planned imaging. Again, another use of the inferior implant approach. This young lady was in Jamaica, and I guess there's some cliff that is very famous to dive off of. And she's in her 50s and was feeling really great, having a good time. Frequently, uh, obviously, something like this is preceded by liberal amounts of alcohol or whatever else is accepted in Jamaica and, uh, and Washington State. Um, but, uh, yeah, so she gets the bravery, dives off this cliff, and the interesting thing is she said it had been a great day um, after this dive as they were putting her in the ambulance. She noted multiple other ambulances coming for other people, so that's when she figured out probably this wasn't the smartest thing. But basically the majority of her fracture was inferior end plate, and you can see this being the pedicles kind of as your, as your indication, the majority of the cement that I wanted to span, span that. And these patients sometimes are a miracle to me because this young lady um, who had been on just significant amounts of, of oral opioids, uh, rolling off the table and, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, torsion on, uh, at the waist is a lot of times where they have their most significant pain. As she began to roll off the table, she was like, it's gone. So just stabilizing that for her uh, was really significant. But again, uh, that the planning based on imaging uh, from the MRI and the inferior implant approach became really powerful tools for me. Again, this is just a, a note to say um, L5 is very tricky. L5 is frequently very humbling for me, but I knew even going into this case that, uh, that I was going to need significant craniocaudal angulation to, to, so that I can come in flat on the superior end plate. So planning really kind of saved the day for me here. I go, oh, did I do that? No. So this is a, this is a patient that came in. I did not do this. Let me just say, again, that is not my work. But this was done uh, by a local physician. Uh, this lady came back in, never had relief from this uh, fracture, had, again, in, uh, uh, Pain increase out of proportion, repeat MRI, new fracture um, that targeted mainly the inferior end plate. I was able to go in and really deposit the majority of the cement. You can see, again, pedicles. So I used the MRI to, to localize my fracture and treated that fracture. Um, and she had a really significant uh, uh, improvement in the pain she felt from this but continue to have pain here. I did multiple blocks, and uh, bottom line, she's going to be getting a pain pump placed. Uh, still a really active uh, lady, and, but was not able to, to get any, pain re any significant pain relief from that prior injury. Um, 
So I, I think um, as, as a person trying to run a business and a person trying to run a practice, a retrieval augmentation gives us vast capabilities because we get, again, it gives us the ability to capture uh, a, a pretty broad uh, population of patients. Another area here, so you get this patient, obviously, um, big lytic lesion here, another lytic lesion here, uh, known uh, history of malignancy, two retrieval bodies here. And if you notice this retrieval body, you notice here, there is no pedicle. This portion of the retrieval body has, has been completely uh, eaten away. So what are our options? You kind of see this device here, and there are several uh, devices on the market that allow us to deliver energy uh, to uh, metastasis, be it a microwave or radio frequency. Uh, this is a device that allows me to deliver radio frequency uh, to tumors, and so it becomes a, a powerful, uh, excuse me, way that we can deliver significant pain relief uh, uh, to these patients as well. And where is this coming from? In the NC, NCC and guidelines, you know, and if you work at all in cancer patients, um, uh, when we meet to talk about these patients, be it whatever uh, primary malignancy, um, there are very specific guidelines created by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network that says this is how we will treat uh, these tumors. Uh, as an interventional radiology, uh, interventional radiologist, Frequently, uh, ablative therapies have been very difficult uh, to enter into the NCC and guidelines. So when we sit down and talk about how we're going to treat patients, some of these therapies aren't, aren't really given their due. But in 2014, it was introduced that, you know, consider interventional strategies in these uh, patients with adult cancer pain and, and therapies like uh, retrieval augmentation, uh, localized uh, blocks uh, like celiac plexus block, uh, neurostimulation and radiofrequency ablation for bone lesions. And it goes on further to say if a patient's vertebral bodies are unstable, it's most uh, probable, uh, it's, it's best to actually treat these patients with stabilization followed by a radi uh, radiation a as indicated. So here's a cancer patient I had, um, and I, I call him my favorite swinger. Um, I'm out in Lodi. Lodi, California was voted the wine region uh, of the year for California. So a lot of old vine, like 100-year-old plus vine zins are present there. It's really, really warm, so you get these really powerful calves coming out. Um, um, but uh, with the wine community comes a huge golfing uh, community as well. And so. A lot of my patients come to me and their presentation is, my swing has changed, um, I'm losing yardage on my drive. And so basically uh, those kind of torsional forces as they're exerted through the waist are, are become very painful for these patients, um, that quadrant loading. So uh, this lady, uh, unfortunate diagnosis, uh, breast cancer, uh, and she comes in with this lesion. So she actually got palliative treatment with radiofrequency ablation. And you can see that I, I span uh, the, the medial component from medial wall to medial wall, the pedicle here, but you'll see how similar uh, it, it, it became in appearance to uh, the actual area that I ablated. It, it, it kind of filled similarly. Bottom line is this lady did extremely well and she followed up with me at her three month this week. Um, uh, still doing really well, had been so painful she couldn't, she couldn't sit to drive, but she's driving on her own, gained a lot of independence. And uh, again, this similar patient I showed you before where the whole half of the retrieval body is, is gone, I planned my approach here. Um, this patient got a, a, a blade of therapies, and then I stabilized the retrieval body as much as I could. Uh, but this is, again, this is palliation. Uh, this patient moves uh, uh, very limited through the day, but with uh, radiofrequency ablation and stabilization, was able to get this patient really good pain relief. Uh, again, another patient I recently treated, um, largely a sclerotic uh, met to the retrieval body, but there were certain lytic components adjacent to the mixed kind of lytic sclerotic lesion. So I traversed uh, the more sclerotic portion and deposited uh, cement uh, within the uh, more lytic component.
This is the craziest thing. You know, I always tell you, like, sometimes you can really hear the ocean in these shells. This is the best shell I ever had. It was like I was right. I, I could hear the ocean so, so well. But I took it home, and it's like I, I couldn't hear it as well. So I don't, it was something about the surroundings that made it really sound like the ocean in that shell at that time. It's like, whoa. This is one of my favorite stories. I, I tell this in a couple of venues. This lady had been a professional ballerina and um, developed uh, breast cancer. Uh, prior to any of the RF systems that were on, I actually treated this uh, with microwave ablation, uh, stabilized it. Again, not, it was not a pretty, uh, was not a pretty outcome. Um, stabilized her. She had significant pain relief. But then, due to so many other areas of metastasis, uh, I ended up placing a pain pump for her. So again, you know, uh, being pain fellows, uh, a, a patient that comes to you uh, for one reason, um, if you provide them significant relief, uh, it, it, it opens up many doors for you to, to, to really take care of that patient. And really kind of, for me, develop those relationships. I, I know I'm one of those people that enter medicine because I need to be loved. Uh, and uh, when you do something like this for a patient and you do something like this for a patient's family, uh, just that feeling of why I enter medicine is, is, is never more significantly re uh, reinforced. But you, you develop li literally just lifelong friends uh, be be because this is just great care for these patients. So this is what I call a good day right here, uh, a little bit of some French classics, uh, some German. Uh, but anyway, uh, questions? Excellent. Thank you.